Okay. I would like to call this uh, Lake Forest Park City Council regular meeting for January Thursday, January 25th to order. And at this time, uh, we will do the Pledge of Allegiance and I've asked Council Member Goldman to lead us, please. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Member. And with that, we're moving on to uh, adoption of the agenda. I would entertain a motion for adoption. Council Member uh, Bertani. I move that we adopt the agenda for J January 25th. We're here second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any comments or questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any days? The ayes have it unanimously. Thank you, Council. And moving on to public comments. We have a full house tonight. Thank you all <laughs> for coming tonight. And I apologize, my voice is challenged at the best. Uh, and so I will defer to some of my colleagues to help me out with some of the various nature uh, <clears throat> vagaries of this uh, meeting. Um, public comment. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, public comments. This portion of the agenda is set aside for the public to address the council on agenda items or any topic, excuse me, the council might have purview or control over. This is an important thing. If the comments are of a nature that council does not have influence or control over, the then the mayor may request the speaker to suspend their comments. I apologize. The council may direct staff to follow up on items brought up by the, by, by the public. Comments are limited to three a three minute time limit. So I thank you all for coming and please keep it civil and respectful. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. We'll start with the folks in, in the chambers tonight. Excuse me, um, Brian Saunders, Bose, please. Well, thank you, uh, council members and mayor for uh, letting me speak. Um, I'm here tonight. Um, I've written you all an email, which hopefully you've all had a chance to read about the uh, proposed 11 unit building on 3803 The ordinances are there to protect our most uh, sensitive ecosystems in which Bachetla Creek, which I'm hearing a lot of people talking behind me that they didn't even know the creek was there. I mean, uh, this is a sensitive area that has been neglected uh, for a long, long time. And um, I think if those ordinances are abided by, especially the one about runoff, when you build a new building, it's my understanding that runoff cannot go into a storm drain that exists now and it needs to be self-contained. I have no idea how they're gonna do that with an 11 unit apartment. That seems really, really difficult. Um, I recently did, uh, by, by the, I'm here for the Stewardship Foundation, uh, the Lake Forest Park Stewardship Foundation, which uh, of course has uh, a mission to try to protect our most sensitive areas. And uh, I recently did a biological assessment of that creek and it is in a horrible condition. And one of the things the Stewardship Foundation is going to be doing over the next year, in fact, it's going to be my number one target, is to grant funds to restore that creek. And uh, the last thing we need is anything that is going to have any kind of detrimental effect on top of what it's already experiencing right now. So I really implore the council to really um, help out with uh, making sure that our ordinances and that uh, our, our most sensitive areas are really being well protected. So thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, next, we have Jeff Snedden. Welcome, oh, Jeff. Before I get started, I'm led to understand that I can hand you something that- Absolutely. Yeah, so- Please. You'll have to share. Uh, <laughs> these, because it, I want to bring light to the fact that um, Thank you. there was a real bad way of sliding. Thank you. In this location. I've seen this before, so- Go ahead. From the slide. They're not that good. Um, they were taken quite a while ago. Anyway, my name is Jeff Stead and I live in Lake Forest Park. I'm here representing many neighbors impacted by the 11 unit townhome proposed for 3803 Northeast 155th. We're deeply concerned about this big built on the rim. 
hold on just a second. There we go. Ah, please continue. We're deeply concerned about this being built on the rim of Blachetta Creek, yards away from the landslide I just referred to that occurred in 1997. It almost toppled the house next door into the ravine. This is a high risk ground to be building such a large structure. 14 homes surround the rim uh, where slopes are pitched at as much as 80 feet and as far uh, above as 90 feet. Five homes are in the stream's path as it exits into Lake Washington. First and foremost, we believe the city should not provide a waiver to the steep slope, 50 foot buffer and 15 foot setback. We also have confidence in the planning department that they're going to scrutinize uh, the developer's various submissions, but there's some really glaring things. The geotechnical study that they submitted is the same one written nine years ago, word for word, and it has a paucity of borings done near the edge of the rim. The stream reconnaissance report was written in 2015, updated with a walkthrough. This classifies the creek as a class N stream. The traffic demand study uses 2013 traffic data with four pages showing traffic flow on 45th and Bothell Way. There's no such intersection. Um, what is the impact? We also ask, what is the impact of multi years of construction on Bothell Way for egress and ingress uh, from 155th? There is no off street parking study. There are 14 stalls and four street side uh, spots, but there are 33 bedrooms. How many cars will it have? Where are they going to park? The site's development plan sh shows six live work units with, um, sorry, uh, six live work units with uh, 60 to 100 square feet. Our municipal code does not mention the word um, live work units. So how does it qualify as a mixed non-residential and commercial use? And this from the Department of Interior at the US Geology, uh, Geological Society. Landslides are triggered by one event, but many causes can weepen, weaken slopes over time, making them more likely to fail. Both natural and human activities can saturate hillsides. Despite intuition that a landslide might mitigate further landslides, the disruption by a landslide can make the slope even more unstable and prone to further landslides. This development should fall under our municipal, cumulative impacts in our municipal code with the in intense instruction Activity, um, Sound Transit, Sound Transit builds a dedicated bus lane and a bridge over the creek, washed out repairing the six culverts. This project cannot be considered standalone. 20 to 30 trees could be cut down in the sensitive area. Additional impervious surfaces from the new bus lane will drain even more stormwater down 155th. So we're asking uh, for your attention and concern about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Snyder. I believe we, next, I think this is, is it Forrest? Mr. Wills. Yeah, I was just going to continue what said. Okay, <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, Jolene uh, Borgerding, would you like to speak? Please. Thank you for joining us. Hi, my name is Jolene Borgadine. I live in Lake Forest Park. I actually wasn't planning to speak. I thought it was just an attendance oh. sign-in <laughs> sheet, but uh, I would just will. like to say I represent um, a neighbor that lives adjacent to the creek, and we've lived there for about 15 years, and the entire time we've considered ourselves stewards of the environment. It's a very beautiful and sensitive area, despite having some environmental issues, as the first speaker pointed out, it's it's a gem. It's a wildlife corridor. We see deer, coyote, owl, osprey, lots of nesting in the ravine. And I'm very concerned that the development, the cumulative plan development and the townhomes will have an a, a terrible, terrible effect. And I implore you to consider the long-term sustainability of the environment when you review these plans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, I apologize here. Jan 
Nimbla, Nomblas. Okay, I apologize. I think the, the sheet is missing the would you like to speak category. So I'll just read your name if you don't, would, you, you're not obligated to speak. Um, it's a friendly crowd, as you can see. So you're, you're fine. Thank you, Jan. Um, Sean Nimlos. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, Mark Johnson. Please, Mark. Welcome. Um, hello, city council members and mayor, Tom French. Um, I was energized six months ago when I found out about the sound transit bus lane coming through and chopping down 391 trees and putting up big concrete wall and came here in July the first time and then another time and realized that um, it was the people of Lake Forest Park versus the sound transit monster that uh, it's an unequal relationship. The people did not have any power in really um, warding off this environmentally destructive plan. And now I see the the stake, wooden stakes and the pink ribbons are on the hillside ready to bring in the bulldozers and, the, and to chop the trees down. So I thought about what is the um, possible way that Lake Forest Park can exercise a sovereign right to make uh, a law or a regulation rule, whatever, that can somehow provide some uh, a way to stop such action. Uh, and that best reason, best thing I could come up with was every tree that's taken out, I don't know the cost of a license for one or permit for one tree to be chopped down. But if the city had the power, made a law that if you want to take a, a, a tree down for a big project, it might cost $50,000 per tree. It might cost 100,000. It could cost $1 million a tree. And that, and, 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 and that would be a sovereign law made by Lake Forest Park City Council, the people. And in such a way, there could be mitigation for environmentally destructive projects. So please consider, you know, saving the trees, charging, a hefty amount for a tree permit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Oh, yeah. I'll, again, try to <laughs> make sure everyone's name keeps coming through this shorter. Uh, David Newman. And I was, no, thank you. Okay. You bet. I was just reminded by my colleague here that we have a really fantastic podium. You can raise it up and down depending on your height. So um, if you're uh, would like to raise it, but the, the switch is on the side. Um, Tyson Greer, friend. I see Jim out there as well. Hi, Jim. Welcome. Well, it's been a long time since I railed at you all. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to um, take off on Jeff's comment about the uh, cumulative impacts. So you go to your doctor, and your doctor says, I don't like these numbers on your sugar. So I know you like desserts, but what I want you to do is only eat three desserts a week. And you say, okay, I can do that. So the week goes on and uh, one night you haven't had many desserts. So you have a um, strawberry rhubarb pie. Wow. That was so good that you're in a restaurant. So you have the tiramisu, you know, haven't had tiramisu for a long time. And then you have death by chocolate. So cumulatively, besides the diabetic shock to a body, it's also a shock to the environment. So it's in the regulation and sensitive area, steep slope, pretty cumulative impact from the, what's going on already, the landslides. So 
I know you all don't look over every permit, but if you were bored one day and did, I would advise maybe talking to somebody because cumulative impacts are big. Thank you. Thank you, Tyson. Great piece of comments. Uh, former council member Phillips. Welcome, Mark. Mark Phillips, I live in Lake Forest Park. I feel like a fish out of water here tonight. I'm going to talk about a different topic, <laughs> uh, but I sense it will be momentary. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about uh, House Bill 1433, currently working its way through the legislature, 1433. This is a bill that I think is very important for Lake Forest Park and for other cities in terms of uh, uh, combating the effects of climate change and reducing greenhouse uh, gas uh, emissions. So this bill would establish a preferred method for in this, across the state for doing a, a home energy audit, essentially, a score for uh, the amount of energy that's used in a home and the amount of uh, uh, greenhouse gases that are created by that home. It takes uh, a method that's been developed by the U.S. Department of Energy and just simply applies that, says that this is the preferred method in Washington state. Uh, Oregon has done this. California has done it uh, successfully several years ago. Uh, so it is, a, it is a method that can work. Um, it's very similar. You surmise quickly, I'm sure, that it's very similar to uh, when you buy a refrigerator, you get a, an energy score on the refrigerator, and you can do comparison shopping in terms of the energy efficiency. So this would, this would essentially create the same kind of system, but for a home. So if you were shopping for a home, you'd have that additional piece of information available to you in terms of what the energy rating of the home was and what its carbon, uh, what, it, what its uh, greenhouse gas emissions were. Uh, and so by doing that, the same way that the energy code on your refrigerator drives efficiency improvements in appliances, this would drive uh, energy efficiencies in homes. You want to sell it, you know, you're going to be selling a home, you might want to pay attention to some of the improvements, you know, that it needs to, to improve that score so it would be more attractive to a potential buyer. Uh, so I think if the system like this were in place, it really would have, we know that, uh, that, that heating buildings like homes, houses, and uh, along with transportation are two major sources of greenhouse gases. And we know that Lake Forest Park is committing to, committed to doing its part to, uh, to, to combat climate change. Um, I think it's a simple step that could have a major impact. The current status of the, and I should say that it's, uh, uh, among five sponsors is our first district representative, Dewar, uh, among the five sponsors of this bill. Um, it's currently in committee in the House, which I believe means that it'll be going to, a, I believe it'll be going to a, a vote of the House very soon and uh, likely to do well there. So it'll be in the Senate next and it'll be in committee and there will be opportunities for hearings uh, in that committee. And uh, I don't know that City of Lake Forest Park can do something as an entity on that. That would be great if that were possible, sure. uh, but uh, it would be very good if uh, individual council members, mayor was to, to weigh in on that, I think would have some weight in that committee. So just asking that uh, if you have some attention for that process and if it's something you think is important, uh, I think it's important. Uh, I'd appreciate your uh, your willingness to speak out about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, let's see. And last but not least, the Violet Boyer. Would you like to speak tonight? Oh, no, I was signing in, but um, I think my phone. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> like the signs. Thank you. Okay. At this time, is there anybody in the council chambers that would like to make public comment? at the dais you bet please just uh <clears throat> excuse me losing my voice state just state your name for the yeah. record please my name is tom grava i live in beach drive in lake forest park uh, thank you all for this opportunity as, as my neighbor jeff steden was saying i guess i have multiple concerns but three come to mind i don't really get to see much of the creek i don't really know it looks like i've never been back there but uh I do live at the bottom of the hill, and we already have runoff problems. I sent an email to you all in October when we had a flash flood and put two inches of water in my basement. Oh, yeah. And this isn't even, I don't think we've addressed that creek at all. It sounds, it sounds like we addressed the creek at all, I do, um, in many years anyway, so it probably needs to be looked at. But number two, I'm really concerned about the width of 155th. Uh, I don't think it's a legitimate road anyway, width-wise, and and 
33 units where this car traffic construction vehicles you know i i'm i just don't see how that road could handle any more cars as it is and emergency vehicles coming down there i'm i tell you what i, I think the city is in a going to be an illegal problem if fire trucks and aid cars can't get down the hill because of x and i just don't want to see that so i just want to pass that along as my thoughts thank you thank you tom okay. appreciate your comments and um moving on anybody else in the council chambers would like to make public comment uh matt do we have anyone in uh mm. virtually that would like to make public comment at this time uh, if you want to address the council, please use the raise hand function. I think we're okay. Yep. Doesn't look like it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. As Just as a reminder, the council, per their own rules, are not allowed to respond at this time. If you have a specific request for the administration to re respond to you, we'd be happy to do so. Uh, it's difficult for me because I have some comments. I'd love to share some information with you folks, but I have to restrain myself. Um, that would be helpful, actually, honestly, uh, about road with other other topics. But you can reach out to us, and we'd be happy to respond um, other in other uh, circumstances. With that, we'll close public comment. Thank you so much for your thoughts. And um, going forward, I think we'll make sure the sign up sheet has a little bit different. Uh, Purview so it can reflect all of your attendance, but also whether you'd like to speak or not. I think that that would be helpful because there's a lot of folks here and I want to make sure you're in the record. So thank you so much. And with that, we're going to move on to where are we? We're on to presentations. Uh, North King County Regional Aquatic Center Feasibility Study. And I believe Corey has the lead. Uh, oh, online. Thank you. Hi, Corey. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Everyone can... Good. How are you guys? A brief pause here for our friends to uh, be able to move in a different direction. Give us one minute, Corey. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm okay. Well, if you have one, I do. actually, that might be helpful. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I, that's another thing going on. Yeah, that I road is 17.5 really feet wide. Red oxygen, so. It's, so it's not even it's not even a two way street. I'll take oh, if you don't mind, do you need one? No, no, no. Okay, thank you very much. The pharmacy. Thanks everybody for coming. That's <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. As soon as we have a second for uh, just create ground. Uh, make your business. A little bit of quiet. We'll so, move on here, folks. The way that the way that. Uh, Wash dot or yeah, Wash dot did a really nice lidar picture of it, mm -hmm. and it showed. Okay, this, let's move yeah. on if we could please. Um, and, and with that, Miss Roche, thank you very much for your um, patience here. Yeah. Hi. So, uh, brief what? background. Are we? Are you guys ready? Yes. Please yeah. go ahead. Um, you can't see the chambers, but there was a lot of folks here. Okay. <laughs> In uh, 2021, King County offered a grant program for aqu aquatic facilities, including planning and fe feasibility for potential new facilities. The city of Kenmore and the city of Kirkland partnered to receive a $100,000 grant along with the city of Kenmore, Shoreline, and Lake Forest Park. All agreed it would be best to combine efforts to identify and evaluate demand, potential locations, design concepts, and costs in this North King County area led by the city of Kenmore. All parties have acknowledged that the North King County is in need of an indoor aquatic facility to serve the community year round. Pools in our areas have been closing, including the Kenmore, Carroll and Wald pool in 2009 and the shoreline pool that served Lake Forest Park residents in 2020. So today uh, we have Keith and Brooke from NAC Architectures to present the findings of the feasibility study. study. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Brooke and Keith. Thank you for coming. You can't see me, but I'm here in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for having us. Welcome. <laughs> I'm Brooke Hanley with NAC Architecture, and I have my colleague uh, Keith Combs here with me, and I'm going to share my screen, and we'll get started on our little presentation here. 
Okay, so there, get the right screen going. Okay, uh, so we've been working on this North King County Regional Aquatic Center's feasibility study. As Corey mentioned, she gave a great background. Thanks, Corey, mm -hmm. for being a part of the, the project. Um, I'm Brooke Haley and I already introduced Keith. And so we'll talk a little bit more about our, our larger team here who uh, participated in the study. As Corey mentioned, there were four cities, Kenmore, Kirkland, Shoreline, and Lake Forest Park. And uh, they, through an interview process, hired NAC Architecture uh, to do the study. We uh, specialize in aquatic and recreation centers, um, specifically studies and design projects. Uh, so we really love working on those. We also have a great group of uh, professional engineers and consultants who fill in our team from business planning, aquatic consulting, uh, cost estimating, civil engineering, and landscape architecture. Um, as Corey also mentioned, there's a little bit of history about the grants and um, the forward thrust pools aging, closing, or becoming privatized. Um, so it's really reducing the amount of water that the North King County cities have access to and the people um, it increasingly have more demand for just water time, um, water safety courses, swimming and uh, lab swimming, all of those kind of features um, in King County. So um, we they combined resources and we worked together to find at two or more uh, potential locations for an aquatic center in the area. Uh, I'll go over our goals or the city's goals for this project, uh, we wanted to identify potential aquatic center locations uh, within the areas mentioned, evaluate the market demand for aquatic center or more, more than one, uh, develop those design concepts so then we could determine the capital and operation cost budgets for those potential aquatic centers. So there was a, a fairly comprehensive process for the feasibility study. Uh, it included um, identification and evaluation of potential sites, and that was done in conjunction with uh, looking at potential partnerships that might be possible for the various sites. Um, we looked at the market conditions for an aquatic center in the North King County area, and we developed a program or a list of spaces uh, that might be in an aquatic center uh, along with design concept options and then corresponding costs for both uh, capital cost and operations. And then finally, we did uh, draw some conclusions as part of the feasibility studies. I want to call attention uh, to the highlighted items here, the site identification and partnership assessment. Um, these we kind of knew all along might be the biggest challenge of the study. And these are the uh, two elements where we spent the most time with our uh, four city uh, steering committee members. So I thought it would be fun to kind of skip to the end and talk about some of our opportunities and challenges that we discovered throughout the process. And then we'll kind of take a step back and go through the process a little bit more in detail. Um, some opportunities. Uh, we definitely found some viable sites that were identified, so that's good news. Uh, the market analysis suggests that new uh, community aquatic centers could be supported in North King County anywhere, you know, between two and three, especially as the um, population continues to grow. The feasibility uh, design concepts and budgets were created, and we'll share that with you as we get into that section. There are a couple of challenges that we've identified along the way. Uh, the city of Lake Forest Park does not currently own a site that could accommodate a center. Um, we, we did look at some sites in Lake Forest Park and Keith will talk about that in a minute. Um, there are some funding partnerships between the cities that would need additional definition and agreements. Um, and the aquatic centers are generally expensive to build and operate and most require some public funding. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about the numbers of that at, uh, as we go along here. All right. So there were uh, a number of sites that were identified for evaluation. Uh, first of all, through the RFP, 
I think there were five sites that were identified uh, through discussion with the steering uh, committee. Uh, we identified a couple more and then through uh, additional exploration through the course of the study, uh, there were a few more sites that were brought to the table. Um, criteria for these sites, uh, you know, is the site big enough? Uh, is a site buildable uh, considering the topography, soils, environmental conditions, other existing conditions? Uh, is the travel time reasonable to get to the site um, considering the area that might be served? And then perhaps the most important, is that site available for use as an aquatic center, either a city owned property or something that might be acquired? Um, you can see on the screen, uh, some of the sites that were looked at. Um, site B that you can see is in the northwest corner of Lake Forest Park. This is the former Kellogg uh, Middle School site. Um, uh, the steering committee did reach out to uh, the Shoreline School District to at least talk about this, um, but there was no response from the school district. Um, in additional discussions with the steering committee, it felt uh, the discussions were that this site didn't feel like it was central to Lake Forest Park or Shoreline or Kenmore uh, or the combination, um, and may even feel like it had a, a stronger connection to communities to the north. And so with those and other, uh, other elements, uh, this was a site that didn't really sort of rise to the top in our evaluation. Um, through that process, though, there were a couple sites that did rise to the top. Uh, Shoreline Secure Storage, uh, Site A on the map, and North Kirkland Community Center, uh, which is uh, Site F on the map. Um, and then there was a lot of discussion about sites in downtown Kenmore. So uh, first of all, um, Shoreline and Kirkland were those were kind of the, uh, the sites that did rise to the top. Um, they're city owned, they're the right size, they're buildable. Um, uh, Shoreline, for example, is a reasonable travel distance from Lake Forest Park. Um, and so those two sites um, did uh, make the cut and uh, additional analysis uh, by our civil engineering team occurred to evaluate the civil engineering civil engineering requirements, stormwater, utilities, uh, again, other existing site conditions. Um, uh, again, there was a lot of interest in, in trying to locate a site um, in Kenmore as Kenmore sort of central to this uh, uh, four community uh, uh, participants in the study. Um, uh, so it would have been ideal to find a site, um, maybe even the, uh, you know, a, a number of sites that flank both sides of Lake Forest Park. Uh, but um, looking at multiple sites in Kenmore, uh, there were major hurdles that we would, uh, that would have had to be overcome, primarily related to site availability or site acquisition. Uh, sort of as a parallel process to the site evaluation, uh, we also considered multiple options for uh, city partnerships. Um, one of the things that we looked at uh, was uh, the idea of maybe a, a single center that would serve um, all four uh, cities in the study, uh, but the steering committee felt like um, uh, that would violate some of the uh, dreams for travel distance and maybe would be uh, too big uh, considering the uh, service area that would have to be covered. So that was uh, an idea that uh, sort of was moved to the back burner. Um, in our discussions with uh, the steering committee, Lake Forest Park and Shoreline uh, mutually agreed that they alone would not be, uh, would not provide enough support in order to uh, work alone on, a, on an aquatic center. Um, uh, also, Lake Forest Park, Shoreline, and Kirkland sort of mutually agreed that um, Kirkland was too far away from Lake Forest Park and Shoreline to have that be a viable partnership. So uh, some of these partnerships were, were, were starting to be eliminated. Um, 
uh, the one that probably has the most importance to, to uh, uh, Lake Forest Park is a partnership between Kenmore Lake Forest Park and Shoreline. And you can see by the little dotted lines that that uh, meant uh, a site in either Shoreline or downtown Kenmore would be um, uh, viable for that for that potential project. And of course, uh, we didn't find one in downtown Kenmore and the Shoreline Secure Storage site was uh, was identified. So um, these were some of the sort of potential configurations for a partnership that we looked at. Those partnerships could, have, could take on multiple forms. Um, it could be a simple agreement between cities to contribute in some way to either capital costs and or operational costs could take other steps in creating sort of official um, uh, partnerships with, uh, for example, a PRSA, which would extend the uh, partnership area beyond city boundaries, uh, a PFD or public facilities district, which would, uh, which allows the collection of sales tax for a project, um, an MPD, a Metropolitan Park District, uh, which could um, could collect tax for both capital and operation costs. So these were um, sort of partnerships that we discussed conceptually anyway as part of the study. So as Keith mentioned, we did pick, narrow down the sites and pick uh, two to three to take a look at through the market analysis and the concept design. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the market analysis and the findings there. The service areas are shown on this map. You can see the little black dots are each of the three sites that were identified. And the red outline is basically the service area, um, which you could drive to in a reasonable time frame. Uh, some of those are overlapping if there were three centers all to be built. So um, the market potential for this area is is quite high. It's three to 6% higher than the national average. So swimming is definitely a desirable activity within the region, and that's leisure swimming or um, fitness swimming. The population and income levels of the cities would support multiple new aquatic centers, uh, given the current market conditions. Um, if more privatized access to water was created, it might um, dilute the pool just a little bit there, but but in the current conditions, they would be supported. Uh, the region is basically deficient in indoor aquatics, both public and private at the moment. So uh, that would support the case for community aquatic centers. Uh, as Keith mentioned, we created some concept programs for different sized facilities and we ended up creating a variety of building sizes to provide some scalable options. Since this is a high level study, we want to give you some options moving forward uh, into a future process if you choose to do so. So the, the um, programs ranged from a 35,000 square foot, 48,000, 58,000, and 90,000 square foot facilities. Uh, the larger facilities did include some community fitness or recreation spaces outside of the pools. Uh, in general, the market analysis or the operations analysis will say that your um, subsidy will be less if you include some fitness or recreation spaces in addition to the pool spaces. So we just wanted to show some of the diagrams that were created for each program. This is a, a view of a potential facility with the roof cut off so you can see the awesome pools on the inside. Uh, this is a 35,000 square foot facility that is placed on the shoreline site uh, with the associated parking and uh, all of the development amenities that was needed. The total projected cost for a facility like this is about 55 million and the projected operation subsidy ranges between 650 and 750 per year, which gives you a cost recovery rate uh, between 71 and 77 percent, which is which is pretty good for an aquatic center. This is the larger version that we created for the shoreline site. Again, the costs are a little higher, um, but since you can 
uh, fit more people inside this aquatic center, the cost recovery rate is a little bit better between 73 and 81%. Um, so Shoreline ended up being very interested in this as a potential to move forward. It, at the Kirkland site, excuse me, uh, we have a 35,000 square foot program that would fit next to their existing community center. Uh, again, it's in the mid $50 million range projected uh, and a cost recovery rate similar to the smaller uh, shoreline site. In this larger program, uh, their community center is currently aging and they're looking to replace it. So this option looked at replacing a new community center along with the aquatic center. So the costs are a little bit higher um, and the cost recovery rate is also a little bit higher because of those community center uh, amenities. So as part of the study, we did uh, sort of draw conclusions for each of the cities, um, uh, speaking to Lake Forest Park in particular, uh, with a smaller population and, and therefore a smaller taxpayer base. It's, it's unlikely that Lake Forest Park would develop an aquatic center on its own. Uh, plus there was no site developed in Lake Forest Park. So the report concludes that Lake Forest Park would be dependent on uh, other communities, other partners, um, and but could develop uh, a partnership to financially support uh, the development of an aquatic center outside the boundaries of Lake Forest Park. Um, this might be a challenge. Uh, Kirkland, as we mentioned, is probably too far away. Uh, Kenmore doesn't have a site. And while Shoreline does have a site, there are expectations for uh, support may not be in alignment with what uh, Lake Forest Park and or Kenmore would be willing to, um, you know, how far they would be willing to go. Um, so it might make sense to uh, take on a community engagement process to determine the public interest in pursuing a partnership and coordinate that uh, public engagement, community engagement exercise with both Shoreline and Kenmore. Uh, Funding support is probably one of the greatest challenges for an aquatic center um, and public engagement uh, will be critical to determine the interest level, uh, inform the public and hopefully build support for some future facility uh, as uh, the process moves forward. So that's, uh, that's where we uh, uh, kind of wrap up the overview of our study and want to see if there's any questions. Thank you, Brooke and Keith. Colleagues, questions? Councilmember Riddle. So, kind of looking at, am I? I'm red. Can't quite hear you. Okay. There you go. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, looking at the the city partnership assessment um, page, it looks like really we need Kenmore to be involved in one or the other in order for for it to come out to be more viable. So the Kenmore and Kirkland or Kenmore LFP and Shoreline. Um, I know it wasn't the directive of your um, assessment, but if we're looking at putting two in, how does that play into the decision making uh, and and sort of the um, sort of the criteria as you guys move as as we move forward, looking at this further? I think is what I'm trying to say. Sure, and I I mean it could be a question of who goes first, um, and. Uh, we of course don't know the answer to that, but uh, Kenmore did say as part of the study that they would not rule out the possibility of contributing to two centers. So uh, Kenmore might go, uh, might be agreeable to a partnership uh, in both directions. Um, although Kenmore also is very interested in having a, a center that would be developed uh, within their own city boundaries. So there are some uh, nuances and complications. Uh, does that does that start to answer your question? Yes, I think so. It kind of feels like we don't want to block off an, a route later for the second or third if the population up here can handle it. So thank you for clarifying how that went. Perfect, thanks. Council Member or Vice Chair for Achani. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank you, Mr. Combs, for your uh, presentation and your colleague. Great too. I think Ms. Hanley. There we go. Um, so uh, what I'm wondering about is I'm looking at the 2020 pros plan for Bothell. And in that, that was their assessment of what their recreation needs were going to be for the next six years. And the pool, like, is at the bottom of their list. And they only allocated 18 million on a dream kind of budget. So I'm wondering, um, you know, is the depth of the appetite for aquatic recreation really that deep here? Or is it just something people said, yeah, it sounds like it'd be great? Based on the market analysis that was done by our business um, consultant, I th think he would say that the the market potential is what we call it is is high here, and because there is so few uh, indoor facilities that are open to community access, that there is a market here um, for that. You know, you know, is there one or two? Um, that there's definitely many key indicators here that would say you could you could definitely build one and support it and it would be very busy. Uh, two would be pretty busy. Three and, and above might start to dilute the um, market just a little bit. Does that it, answer your question? Please, yeah. I just wanna to add to that a little bit. I mean, it is interesting in North King County um, and even in the state of Washington, there, even though the the market says the need exists and the, there would be support, um, the support is a struggle in Washington and North King County. Um, you may be aware that um, this, your city partners, Shoreline's tried before, Kirkland's tried before, Kenmore's been involved in uh, a PRSA where they've done studies before, and um, none of those have resulted in, you know, a, a pool facility for North King County. So there is this interesting sort of dichotomy of uh, proven need by analysis, but lack of support for um, some unknown reasons. Right. And I, I guess I should have asked you my real question then, which was, <laughs> Um, when you asked this question of your outreach folks, did you, uh, did did you include the price tag? Because I think that's where Bothell basically got their results from. As they said, this is going to cost actually tens of millions of dollars to build, and I think some people balked at that uh, at, at that cost. Yeah, I I would say that there is a range of costs for aquatic centers, and we just did a study for Issaquah, and theirs came in at around eighteen million, but they're they have really reduced their scope to a smaller facility um, with a defined pool that uh, isn't as large as these facilities. So as we're, as you're defining the scope and what you really need, um, that can definitely impact the cost, so. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bodie. Thank you very much. And thank you for the presentation. Uh, the thing that occurs to me is that the Shoreline School District is also an essential partner. Uh, our school district, unlike some others, doesn't have a pool and our swim teams have been scrounging space wherever they can find it. Uh, and, and so I realize you said that the school district didn't really respond to you on some questions that you raised. But in our area, if you look at Shoreline and Lake Forest Park together in that potential partnership, I think we would need the Shoreline School District also as an essential partner. So could you comment on that and um, uh, thoughts of how you considered the needs of the school district and, in terms of uh, market potential and also uh, potential partnerships with the school district, which could be involved in in even a, an element of that funding. <laughs> Brooke, <laughs> all right, I'll dive in and uh, you can you can rescue me. Um, Good. Uh, in our experience, there has been some reluctance uh, from school districts to uh, support, um, particularly the capital side of uh, an aquatic center. And um, and then if you were to overcome that hurdle, um, and again, we don't really know, we, we didn't 
get into the depth of um, exploring where Shoreline School District's appetite might be. Um, but again, no response might say something. Um, but then once, uh, uh, if there is a facility, then there's always that debate about um, how it is used and who gets it when and, um, and how it's shared. And so that, that is another challenge when you have a school district involved with a community aquatic center. Um, is, it possible to, here. is it possible to circle back around? Because it seems to me that A, we would want their, um, their partnership support in terms of potential future usage. And I would want to make sure that, it, especially if it was a Lake Forest Park shoreline partnership, uh, that's the dimensions of our school district. And uh, as I said, our swim team has no facility right now. Uh, our swim teams have no facility right sure. now. So it, it just seems to me that a feasibility study that doesn't at least have that conversation with the school district or and look at that element and the implications for the use of the facility and and maybe they don't have money for capital use, but they would be contributing to operational costs. Mm -hmm. Seems to me that's for our area, Shoreline and Lake Forest Park, pretty pretty fundamental. So I don't know if it's too late to include some element of that, but but I would encourage it. Sure. Yeah, I I would add to um, what Keith was saying there. We took into account the needs of the swim teams through the school district. Uh, when thinking about the pools, the lap pools that were included in the concept designs and our, our business consultant included those rental rates, you know, if, if the school district at a very minimum wants to partner from a, a rental rate uh, solution, then he takes that into account and um, includes that in the, the operations revenue and potential, uh, which has uh, an impact on the yearly subsidy there. So could I also say, though, that in terms of getting funding, wouldn't it be helpful to have support from the school district of some sort? Or do you think that doesn't matter? I think that the school district has their has a lot of needs. They have a lot of priorities uh, for the buildings that they currently own. Uh, if they were willing to expand one of their existing facilities, uh, at the high school, say, for example, uh, that might be something that they could put into a future bond. Um, I know uh, Snohomish has a really good example of a school district uh, owning a separate facility, and so there might be some uh, corollaries to make there. It's it's really up to the school district, I think, and the, the appetite of the taxpayers and if they're willing to vote for um, bonds that would support the capital cost. I misunderstood costs. my question. Oh, if okay. It's a shoreline facility, such as you describe here, which is designed to, um, to some extent, to take into account possible rental for swim team use on a regular basis by our school district, then wouldn't it help to get funding for the shoreline facility to have support from uh, the shoreline school district? Or do you think that that support from a school district isn't politically significant. And, and you're talking about, uh, in this in this case, uh, capital support. You're you're muted. Muted. Yes, politically supporting capital without providing capital. I, I definitely think that they would could be a partner um, to support you know, in the, the outreach efforts and the fundraising efforts for uh, a facility that's outside of their uh, school facilities, if that's what you're, am I getting yes, <laughs> your question yes. a little I'm bit sorry. better? I'm sorry, I feel like I've taken up too much time, but I, I do think um, some more reaching out to the school district and having some conversations so that they're kind of, uh, they're a, a, a lesser partner, not a capital construction partner, but a partner of support would be very helpful, especially if Shoreline wants to move ahead with this facility. And and we can we can reach out and ask that question. Um, again, as Brooke mentioned, uh, the the uh, operation analysis is banking on some support from from them. Um, but uh, 
Well, we can ask we can ask that question and see if we what kind of answer we get. Thank you. Thank I, you, uh, Councilmember Goldman. Um, yes. So first, um, I concur with you that only the shoreline option would be feasible. I think the Kirkland option is just too far from here. Uh, my question for you, when you talk about partnerships between cities, how do you have, have you done any thinking about how the cities would split the costs? Would it be purely based on population? Would it be adjusted for income? Would cities that are further away get a discount? I mean, have you gone into that level of thinking? We, we really didn't. And, um, and again, I think this is one of the challenges of, this, of the studies in that, um, and I alluded to this a little bit, that the expectations that Shoreline might have might be different than um, the expectations that Kenmore might have for contribution to a Shoreline Center. And um, since we, um, published the report, we did a similar presentation to the Kenmore City Council, and at least one and maybe more than one of the City Council members in Kenmore said, well, um, we, we might be interested in some partnership in Shoreline, but we would want to be a junior partner. Um, that was the wording that was chosen. So um, again, as part of the study, we didn't look at sort of specific uh, levels of partnership, uh, but I do think it'll be a challenge. Um, I think it's, uh, there's, there's the challenge of, um, you know, each city, Shoreline, Kenmore, uh, probably in their hearts, they really would prefer a, uh, a center in within their own city boundaries too. And so that adds another layer of complexity to that question. I, I would add that the report does have some potential options for paths to take to create um, taxing bodies or uh, partnerships that could be explored further. Um, but I think the cities weren't quite ready to have those conversations uh, yet in detail without some more um, public input. Yep, thanks. And I did do some envelope math before the meeting, and if it was just on population for Shoreline, Kenmore, Lake Forest Park, we were about 15%. And so our share, if it was divided equally like that, would be about 7 to $10 million. So just to put that in the thoughts of my fellow council members. Thank you, council member. I love napkin math. <laughs> Colleagues, other other questions? Uh, uh, Mr. Lieber, you haven't spoken yet. Um, thank you so much for the study. I'm curious, you mentioned um, sort of pass forward and um, do you see it being that the cities are coming forward or how do you see what are the next steps? Um, it is a lot of money. And so what is the process? To, are, is it that one of the cities is going to say, yes, I want to champion this or what is the process to go forward? Yeah, I think I think you said the right word, champion. Um, someone's got to take that bold step forward and say, uh, "We want to try to do something." And um, and uh, if the other cities are willing to do that or not, we don't know. Um, uh, there was. Uh, there's definitely a level of interest in all of the cities that were partnered as part of this study, um, uh, but we haven't heard from any of the cities that, you know, yes, yay, we're ready to go, let's take the next step. So, um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at now. Brooke, uh, anything you want to add to that? I think Shoreline is going to amend, uh, append this report to their pros of plan, and uh, it, it has been identified as a as a high priority for them. Uh, they already purchased the site. It's basically they're ready to do something with it. So, um, if I could venture a guess, I think Shoreline might be the one that could potentially take the lead here with yeah, and, further and, discussion. And although this doesn't necessarily directly impact Lake Forest Park, you may be aware that Kirkland had a levy that would support the a levy that would support construction um, of a new facility. Uh, 
that was on the ballot in early November, and um, and that proposition did not pass. Um, and so Kirkland is interested in continuing to try. And um, so they were interested in a, perhaps a smaller city that involved a partnership and that uh, meant that uh, the facility that uh, was proposed with this study uh, for Kirkland and Kenmore is of interest to them. Thank you. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank um, you. I did have a question about the uh, the service areas map includes going up into Snohomish County. Was there any desire to approach any of the Snohomish County cities or was that not discussed in this study? We as as the consultants hired by these four cities, we were asked to consider basically these four cities. Thank you. Thank you. And then I had one more comment, if I may be obliged. Um, when looking at these and pricing these out, I know parking is a big thing. <laughs> we always try to reduce parking and 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 more greenscape, but knowing these large service areas, um, did you did you run into like parking being a challenge or did you feel like these facilities could meet the need of the service area in relation to parking capacities? Yeah, we did uh, study the zoning code requirements for parking uh, for an aquatic center or a recreation center. Uh, so these sites all show basically the minimum amount of parking, uh, especially in Shoreline, they were interested in the idea of using public transit for a lot of their the people who would visit the center. So just thinking about how public transit or walking or biking might be another option besides uh, having a larger parking facility. In Kirkland, uh, you can't tell in this view of the rendering, but the parking is taking up this lower level and going underneath the facility. So they were they were interested in having a few more spaces in this design. Fantastic. I think considering Lake Forest Park has challenging public um, uh, bus access over to Shoreline, I think that's something to consider if we're to move forward with a, a Shoreline facility. Thank you. Colleagues, I think we need to move on here, but I had a couple of quick thoughts, a little historical context to... Um, I did want to ask the question of what is this in, in the full meal deal, the bells and whistles scenario, what is the acreage size or square footage size of a lot that's necessary for this kind of installation? Facility? Yeah, that's right. It's uh, in the neighborhood of four acres. Four acres. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, uh, I'm going to say four acres is kind of the minimum. Okay. Um, and so like, uh, in the shoreline sites, uh, I think it's slightly larger than four acres with a larger uh, project, but uh, four acres was the minimum. Thank you. Um, a couple other questions. Um, well, actually comments. One, the colleagues, I would just say that it sounds as though this is going to fall into political kind of emphasis to look to having conversations with our surrounding communities. I'm a product of forward thrust pools. I learned to swim in a forward thrust pool. I uh, learned to scuba dive at the Shoreline Center, former Shoreline um, High School pool, and sad that that's been closed. It's a question of equity about pools. And this is something that I believe these our four cities needs to come to get, we need to come together and find, uh, we can't do it alone. And Shoreline's tried but we all need to get behind. Uh, they've carried the burden in the past. We all need to get behind whoever's going to be the leader here and try to find a way to make this happen because it really is important for our young people and our community. So if there are no other comments, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for joining us tonight. And uh, Brooke and Keith, we sure appreciate all your efforts on our behalf and great presentation. Thank you so much. Well, and I appreciate your make it happen attitude. Um, mm -hmm. That's uh, that's what it's going to take. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. All the best. Have a good evening. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Corey. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night. You as well. All right. We are moving on to uh, Star Chase Technology. We have Sergeant Adam uh, Ross Adams is going to be joining us here. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. Uh, one quick. Uh, question, are we okay? Executive session is scheduled at 
eight, we can move it back. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Get to use the cool thing. I am going to move this up. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right, Mayor French, Council members, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, as you all know, my name is Ross Adams. I'm a sergeant with the Lake Forest Park Police Department. I have been employed here for uh, coming up on nine years, and I have a career in law enforcement spanning uh, over two decades. Why is that relevant? I'll tell you why. Um, the number of years in my career is relevant because when I started, if someone ran from the police in a vehicle, we chased. It did not uh, matter why. Um, it didn't matter the crime. It didn't matter the traffic conditions necessarily. Unfortunately, in my career, early on, uh, I was party to vehicle pursuits where uh, the suspect vehicle did crash into innocent motorists. Uh, thankfully, no one was ever seriously injured in any of my pursuits. However, I have responded to in my career vehicular pursuits where people were seriously injured. In 2021, legislation was passed. And in 2023, that legislation was modified that seriously restricted, and for good reason, when law enforcement can engage in vehicular pursuits. I will tell you from having been involved in so many pursuits in my career, the one of three things happens. The person gives up and they pull over. That doesn't happen very often. Their vehicle is disabled for whatever reason and they stop and they either give up or they run on foot. Or the third is they crash into somebody else and that's what happens. We have, up until recently, limited technology that we can use. Uh, we have various maneuvers we can use, uh, uh, pursuit immobilization technique. It's called a pit, pit maneuver, uh, where you use your patrol vehicle to spin an, uh, the, the pursued vehicle out. You can use intentional intervention, which is literally ramming them. That's lethal force. We have spikes, spike strips that we can deploy. There are positives and negatives to using spikes. Uh, if you've ever been out standing on the side of a dark road when a car is coming at you at 100 miles an hour, it's scary. Have we lost officers in this nation deploying spike strips in these circumstances? Yes, we have. So. We needed better options. And about a decade ago, there was a company on the East Coast that started exploring better options. Uh, this company uh, called Star Chase came up with a, uh, a launchable GPS tracker that allows law enforcement to, to track vehicles that flee from us. Now, as we know, if you've read the news lately, or if you've talked to people in Lake Forest Park, stolen cars are being used to commit crimes in a whole new creative way. They're stealing vehicles and running them into the fronts of businesses, whether it is a uh, marijuana dispensary, which we've experienced recently, whether it is a convenience store, a gas station, um, the mom and pop shop. I will tell you, we cannot pursue these vehicles. We cannot pursue these suspects. They are doing hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage to each business. They are doing it in a stolen vehicle. And we don't have a means of apprehending them immediately. Sometimes we don't even get to find that vehicle uh, ever. We don't get to process it for latent prints or DNA evidence at a later date. So, I always put this in every presentation I do for council. I've been now in front of you a few times. <laughs> um, this is the mission statement of the Lake Forest Park Police Department. And our mission is to develop and support a team of professionals 
who consistently seek and find innovative policing strategies to affirmatively promote, preserve, and deliver those quality services which enhance security and safety in our community. To support this mission, we will work in strong partnership with the community. I took an oath to uphold the Constitution and to protect life and property. That is what I'm here for. That is what your police department is here to do. It is frustrating the victimization that has occurred with the massive increase in property crimes and vehicle thefts. So we want to do something about this. I told you about this company on the East Coast. They came up with Star Chase. Again, it's a vehicle-mounted GPS launcher. It shoots a GPS tag. I don't, sorry, I shouldn't say shoot. It launches. This is, <laughs> I will tell you, this has been classified as a non-lethal tool. Okay, it's been evaluated. It is accepted by the ACLU. It is, it, it's a beautiful thing. The effective range of these honestly isn't much. Uh, it is about three car lengths. That's what you'll see. This GPS tag, it's a little smaller than a can of soda. It has a very sticky, gooey, spongy tip to it. What this does, uh, if an officer is in uh, a position to do so, they deploy this tag, has a laser aiming device. They deploy it. Their, their main target, they're going to shoot for roughly around the, uh, the, the license plate or the rear of the vehicle. This, once it deploys, it immediately start sending GPS positional data to a web-based app that these officers have access to on site right there. They, uh, we can also have our dispatch center have access to this. This, this product is designed to make everyone safer, to, uh, to limit the uh, the need for vehicle pursuits. Yes, the current legislation says we can pursue for X, Y, and Z crimes. Um, is it always the necessity? That really depends on what's going on at the time. But one other component, other than holding someone accountable, is the recovery of property. No one has the right to take your vehicle that you either left running because it's 20 degrees outside and it's January, uh, you want to warm it up so you can take your kids to school, or you just happen to have it parked in front of your house and you own a Hyundai or a Kia. These tags allow us the ability to track the vehicle, to take our time, to set up appropriate resources, to not engage in high-speed pursuits, to not even put a patrol car three blocks ahead. So when the suspect driver drives by them, they get spooked and they suddenly go hundred miles an hour again. It allows us to, if we cannot track and contain that suspect while they are in the vehicle, at the very least, we can recover that vehicle, return it to the owner, and then process that vehicle for latent print evidence so that we can uh, identify those, those suspects at a later date. This promotes a much safer environment for officers, for the public, and for the people driving these vehicles and fleeing from us. So I want to emphasize, first and foremost, this is truly considered a pursuit de-escalation tool. This is what it looks like. This is not a cannon mounted on the front of a car. It's not uh, in the public eye. It is going to be barely imperceptible, really. Uh, it either can be mounted in the grill, as you see in that upper left-hand photo, uh, or it uh, can also be mounted on the front push bars of a patrol vehicle. Uh, the bottom photo is a, an actual deployed GPS tag. They're very small, unobtrusive. Um, and then th uh, that uh, image on the right is the app that we would use to then track those GPS tags. Considerations of, of using this product. As I mentioned, for us, if we have time on our side, things go so much better. Uh, it allows us time to recruit resources from other agencies to uh, come up with uh, better investigative plans. Anytime we can slow down an interaction, it goes better for us and it goes better for the public. Not having a pers uh, pursuing patrol car behind a suspect vehicle 
or a fleeing suspect vehicle, um, I can tell you, as soon as you back off and they get a few blocks ahead, they slow down. And if I can keep a, a fleeing vehicle from flying 100 miles an hour through a school zone, I can I would I would do that 10 out of 10 times. Mm -hmm. It also reduces these high stress, rapidly evolving circumstances that occur when a suspect who doesn't want to be caught suddenly has a police officer right up at their door. If they're armed, that forces certain confrontations we'd like to avoid. If they want to fight, same kind of thing. Um, I mean, there, there are any number of scenarios that one could imagine that, where this really just kind of goes bad. But um, if we can minimize those high stress confrontations that occur at the door of a vehicle where we're not fighting with somebody there, then that's, that's, that's really pretty ideal for, for everybody involved. Now, the public is also going to be interested in this because, again, we're limiting, we're reducing the number of vehicular pursuits. Uh, this promotes a much safer environment for the community. And it also enhances community safety by recovering property that they own. And this word gets out. I can tell you from working with agents, with other agencies that use this technology, the word gets out to not run from these agencies because they will track you down with this, with this uh, device and they will find you. And if we can make this a hazard to say an unfriendly environment for people who want to take your property, I'm for that. Now, as I mentioned, the ACLU has reviewed this extensively. Uh, I can certainly get those at a later, or those, uh, those comments for you at a later date, if you would like. Uh, but the intent of this is not to set up a prolonged investigation. This is not something that we would, if we were to use a GPS tracking device for a, for a criminal investigation, that would be something that we would involve a court order for. We also have to respect that these are rapidly unfolding events that these oftentimes, most oftentimes involve stolen property belonging to someone else. These people who are driving these vehicles do not have a property interest. And we will know that this is a stolen vehicle because then the victim has then filed a police report with a police agency. We wanna make sure we respect people's constitutional rights. We will always do so. I, I've talked about this several times in front of council. Um, this, is, this is a very big point for the Lake Forest Park Police Department. Again, always a question is funding. Officer Walker, who I'm sure most all of you know, uh, he and I worked together to apply for a grant. It's a reimbursement grant through the Washington State Department of Commerce. They announced this grant, I want to say in the fall, and uh, we knew that this was technology that this city needed. Um, so among 48 agencies that applied, we were one of 18 that were successful. Uh, this program will cost uh, 49600 and some odd dollars to equip five of our patrol vehicles. Uh, I've already made arrangements to uh, secure this, uh, this contract, obviously pending approval by city council, um, and uh, to procure it and provide uh, training for our train the trainer, or our staff would be train the trainer courses for them. And uh, really, we're looking at about two months, give or take, uh, in order to once we get the contract with Commerce and that is uh, officially executed, then we would we we would move on that. And that's pretty much what I have for you. As always, thank you for your time, and I'm open to any and all questions that you might have. Thank you, Sergeant Adams, for the excellent presentation. Friends, questions, Councilmember Riddle, and then Councilmember Good. Comment and then a question. I, I recall, I think, standing outside and talking with you about these pursuit laws yeah. and, and the struggle. And I think I may have said, if only there was some way to tag them. And you're like, maybe. <laughs> and here we are <laughs> with a, a tested uh, product that yes. can actually do that. Um, so my question is, so obviously, it's, it's, it's part of the vehicle. So there may be like a short need to, to sort of engage in a pursuit in order to tag and then you you back off. Is that um, is that something that's kind of 
okay within our current pursuit laws is is to 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 follow them to tag them and then you you can back off and not engage in a long pursuit what, what is what is your thought on sure that it is absolutely accepted uh in current policy and practice to uh make an attempt to stop okay we we have to give people the opportunity however when they begin to drive rec recklessly endanger the public um excessively violate you know speed laws that that's that's when we discontinue that's when we shut off siren siren lights and we no longer follow yeah thank you for that clarification appreciate yeah, of course. it of course that's good oh it's on it's, oh, it's always on it's always on okay three things is it re are the tags reusable how hard are they how hard are they to remove in case someone knew that they were there stopped tried to remove it and what's the maintenance like are these things are are they are the probes reusable with just replacing the sticky stick and how hard are they to re take them off sure. and the maintenance costs sure absolutely um yes they are reusable um they pull off fairly easily um well with a firm grip and a tug it will it will pull off the back of the car or come off the back of the car it will not damage the surface um it in terms of maintenance so they are reusable um and so it is it really comes down to damaged materials that um they are i don't have a per unit actually cost off the top of my head uh for for the uh the gps tags i, I can certainly get those yeah. um but the initial purchase does include uh, the launchers, the training, and uh, extra tags for each vehicle. Yeah. How many tags do you get per vehicle? Uh, how many extras? Well, or... you're allotted a certain amount of tags per vehicle. And so how long would it take you to use that many based on your current workload? Sure. Uh, the So each launcher holds two tags. Um and it's just it's a reloadable uh launcher uh it's funny you, you asked or you mentioned the current workload um if an officer is proactive enough and and we have some very proactive officers it is a weekly occurrence that cars are running from yeah. an officer if not many cars running from many officers it's it's interesting right now mm. yeah thank Colleagues. you Customer Goldman. Um, yeah, so first, uh, I really appreciate you coming here to talk about this. And I, I really appreciate when you and other officers bring us less lethal mm -hmm. alternatives to current policing. Um, Council Member Good asked one of my questions. Um, <laughs> I, I have two other questions. First, uh, what sort of what's the efficiency? And that you know, if you're chasing a car, like the initial chase, how accurate is that initial projectile to adhere to their car? And then the second is you mentioned the Department of Commerce grant. Does that cover 100% or is that only is that a fraction of the startup costs for the five vehicles? Sure, I'll answer the first or the, the second question first. Sorry to go out of order. Uh, it is a full, uh, yeah, it covers 100%. And now in terms of uh, effectiveness, what I've learned in speaking with other agencies is that some officers, the more they practice, the more deployments they've had, the more accurate they are. It's a laser aiming device, uh, typically is effective between 10 and 40 feet. So up to, you know, maybe uh, two and a half, three car lengths. And anytime there's so many dynamics uh, i mean physics really starts to play in with speed acceleration um and then the physics of the vehicle in terms of road service vibration um how these how these work is as the launcher is booting up if you will um, it actually heats the uh the the sticky portion and the longer it has a chance to heat up the more effective it is so any scenario where if we spot a stolen vehicle in traffic, you can arm the device, give it, and I don't know what the, off the top of my head, I can't quote what the, you know, ideal amount of time is to, to get it ready. Uh, people I've talked with 
it's ready to go within about 10 to 20 seconds. So, um, but in ideal conditions with the right officer, with the right training, 80 to 90% probably is what I would estimate in terms of uh, actual successful deployments. Yep. That's good. And and also on top of you bringing us these um, initiatives, I also appreciate that you come with funding. That, 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 so <laughs> I'll do my best. Yep. <laughs> I see Director Vaughn giving a thumbs up, <laughs> or maybe two. <laughs> uh, Councilmember Furutani. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Sergeant Adams, for the presentation. And also, I love the fact that you are you're, you have answers to all of our questions. So thanks for all the research you must have done on this on this particular product. Um, just to drive this home. Uh, the uh, recent incident at the dispensary that's been outlined in the city administrator's report, would this have been a very effective tool in that particular um, incident? The most recent one at the Cushery on the north end of the city? Yes. 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank Colleagues, you. any other questions for Sergeant Adams? I just want to say I saw a demonstration of this technology when it was in development a number of years ago. It is way past what I saw. And it's, it, I think it's an amazing uh, technology. I want to thank you and the department for your commitment to the innovation part of your mission statement. Uh, the kinetic rounds that uh, kinetic um, disabling, um, I don't want to say weapons because they're not weapons, but ways to use non-lethal forces, mm -hmm. Council Member Goldman indicated, uh, is, is a, something that's really important for everyone. And I know that it's um, very important for your department. So I want to applaud you for that. And and really appreciate your bringing this to us, Ross. Colleagues, anything else? And if not, what's the next step? Well, I believe we'll have a contract coming back to for your approval. That is correct. Thanks. All right. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much, it, Sergeant. Thank, Thank you, you, Sergeant. Thank you. Okay. With that, we're moving on to the consent calendar. I didn't entertain a motion for adoption of the consent calendar. So Sir. moved. Thank you. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments on the consent calendar? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any days? You guys have it. Thank you, Council. That passes unanimously. Uh, and we are moving on to ordinance, ordinances and resolutions for action. I want to thank Councilman Riddle for giving me throat lozenges. I think I've got a second wind here. Uh, resolution number 24, four, uh, 1941, authorizing the mayor to execute a the local and community projects program grant number, I'm just going to paraphrase here, Town Center to Burke Gilman Trail Connector Project. Mr. Sylvia, you have the floor. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. And good evening, everyone. Um, I introduced this item at the first regular meeting this month. Uh, as a brief reminder, this is a request to authorize the mayor to sign a grant agreement with the State Commerce Department, uh, which would fully fund the 30% design phase of the town center to Burke Gilman trail connector uh, project. And uh, at the meeting, there was discussion about a statement in the agreement scope of work attachment that uh, council members found problematic. Uh, that statement referred to commerce's right to uh, recapture grant funds if the city failed to complete the project. And it, it wasn't clear whether the term project referred to the full multi-phase project, including construction, or the 30% design phase uh, of, the, of that multi-phase project. Uh, after the meeting, I asked Commerce to consider clarifying uh, or removing that statement, and they agreed to remove it, as you will note in the revised agreement in the packet. Um, I hope that addresses Council's concern. Uh, but I'm I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about the revised agreement uh, in the packet. Thank you, Mr. Sylvia. I would defer to the colleagues that raised the question. Councilman Relibo, would you like to comment? Um, thank you. I'm good. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bodie, did you have any questions or comments since you raised no. that? No, I also um, am happy to see that change, and uh, I'm good with the agreement. Okay, so with that, if uh, colleagues, any other, anyone else have any other questions on point? If not, I'd entertain a motion for adoption because there's this is slightly time sensitive. 
Mr. Uh, Mr. Furtani, excuse me. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to move uh, resolution number 241941, authorizing the mayor to execute, and I will say the full meal due here, <laughs> local thank and you. community projects pro program grant agreement number 2396643117 with the state of Washington Department of Commerce for the town center to Burke Gilman Trail Connector project. We're here second. A second. Been moved and seconded. Any other comment? I'm sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. my apologies. So, uh, backing up a my second. Okay. Colleagues, would you uh, entertain a motion to suspend the three touch rule? Councilmember Fertani. Yes, at the risk of uh, certain members of our audience uh, ire, I'm going to ask the council, I move to suspend the three touch rule. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any uh, questions on suspending or comments on suspending three touch rule? Mr. Um, Goldman. I'll be brief. I'll be voting in favor, though I do think as a practice, we should justify why we want to. And in this case, Please. it is fairly, I mean, it is somewhat time sensitive. The consultant is ready to get started. And basically this is us accepting money to do something that we're interested in doing. And so for those reasons, I'm comfortable suspending the three touch rule rather than waiting an additional two weeks to start this project. Thank you, Councilmember Goldman. Mr. Furtoni. And I'd also like to add to Councilmember Goldman's statement that uh, in fact, none of uh, this, there's no city matching funds involved with this whatsoever. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Lebo. Uh, I would like us to maybe consider not necessarily now, because I don't think we can, but the idea that where we have administrative uh, functions that uh, we consider either a single or a two touch to spend time to talk about what are essentially contractual administrative issues that don't really have any policy other than administrative. I would propose that we have one or two touches and that we, uh, we respect the public's time and effort uh, to make what should be administrative functions more efficient. Because to spend a month trying to go through something where there are no issues or to justify that we should touch it three times, I don't think is really the best interest of the council or the public, because then we get into the situation that we're waiving the rules for a three touch all the time, when in fact, I, I, I think it's quite appropriate when we're talking about policy issues. But when we're talking about contractual administrative issues, I think the public might think that we're spending too much time talking about things that otherwise could be done more quickly and efficiently, for which government is oftentimes criticized for not doing. Sage advice, Councilmember Lebo. Thank you for that. Uh, it's been moved and seconded to uh, suspend the three touch rule. All those in favor, say aye. Please. Aye. 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 Any nays? The ayes have it. Uh, the three touch rule has been suspended unanimously, and we'll move on to the original motion, uh, taking action on resolution twenty four nineteen forty one. Um, I guess we should probably have a first and second again. Oh, okay, so I'll. Make the motion to approve resolution number 24, 1941, authorizing the mayor to execute the local and community projects program grant agreement number 23-966-43117 with the State of Washington Department of Commerce for the Town Center to Burke Gilman Trail Connector Project. Deep breath. Good job. Thank you very much. Do I hear a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any other further, further comment? Hearing none, all those, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? The ayes have it. Thank you, Council, very much. Thank you, Mr. Sylvia. I appreciate your help on this and getting the clarification. With that, we're moving on to uh, Attorney Pratt is going to bring to us uh, item B here, Ordinance 24-1287, amending Chapter 2.30 of the Lake Forest Park Municipal Code Salary Commission to amend date reference for Salary Commission's first review of salaries and benefits. Welcome. Thank you. You can lower that or raise it's okay. it. It's okay. I'm good. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Good. And uh, Council Member Lebo, thank you for the introduction to this item. This is our third touch on um, an ordinance that you would be changing to eliminate the dates, 20, the, the reference um, to 2022, because the Salary Commission was not um, appointed. And so we just want to clear up that and not create confusion as to what years they're um, work would be in. And so that's what this resolution does. Colleagues, okay, any questions Sorry. for Ms. Pratt? 
think this is another perfunctory kind of situation. I, if there are no questions for Attorney Pratt, I'd entertain a motion for adoption of Resolution 24 1942. I move to adopt Ordinance 24 1287, amending Chapter 2.3 over the Lake Forest oh, Park Municipal Code Salary Commission to amend date references for salary commissions, first review of salaries and benefits. Thank you, Councilmember Riddle. I was moving on too quickly here. A second. Uh, it, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, hearing no discussion or questions, all those in favor of adoption of an or ordinance 24 1287, please signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any nays? The ayes have it. Thank you, Council. Thank you very much, Ms. Pratt. Appreciate that. Um, we are on to item C. <laughs> now we're on to. Uh, <laughs> Amended uh, resolution 24 14, uh, 1942, amending the City of Lake Forest Park Governance Manual regarding public comment. Thank you all for your work on this and the three of you that got together to put it together. Um, what's your pleasure, Council? Councilmember Riddle. Uh, Deputy Mayor has asked for me to just sort of give a highlight of this before we get going. So just to put down some context Excellent. for the folks who weren't on the committee. Uh, so there were two pieces that we really were trying to target with this revision. One is addressing the public comment issues that we have been seeing and trying to tighten that up in response to the comments that we heard from council and trying to align that. And two, to give it a little bit of a refresh to match the process that we're already been doing, because some of this was not in alignment with our current process. So we felt that the, this would be a good time to do that. So in general, um, we added, or we moved the the information about um, the, the the decorum of the council and 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 the disruptive speech speech to its own paragraph, so it it's easier to understand and find that. Um, otherwise, we are just clarifying how the um, how people can ask for uh, public comment, how we can take away public comment, and. Um, Pretty much that's about it. Um, oh, and added the bit about reading into the record, um, the email public comments uh, so that we have a record of those as well. Um, if anyone has any specific questions about any specific part of the edits, I think the committee would be open to answering those for you. Deputy Rear Bodie. I just wanted to say that I appreciate the work that was done by the committee. It was very thoughtful and well done and I'm in support of the changes. Thank you, council member. Uh, excuse me, deputy mayor, Bodie. <laughs> <laughs> Colleagues, any other questions or comments on point? Council member Fertani. Um, I just wondered on a, on a it's, it's almost a point of order. Um, if, we were to, if we were to pass this tonight, uh, would those uh, comments that we've all been getting about the uh, Bushetley Creek development be uh, read into the record then? Would you like to clarify? I think what we would we would need them to send them in as a public comment for the public comment period. So if that that was noted in an email, then that's uh, I think how it would be. I don't think we want all, not necessarily yet. We want just all communication to be read in. Just if it happens to be something they want to say during public comment, and that's a way for someone who isn't able to come into the chambers mm -hmm. to be able to provide a public comment. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I. I uh... Just on point, uh, Administrator Hill reminded me that when we were reading all the comments into the public record, it did take a significant, significant amount of time reading, saying that we received something or if somebody is unable to actually be here in person. It, it, I appreciate the work that you all have done. I think it's a, it's a really big step forward. I am disappointed just to say that I was ready for this if you needed in case we had bad comments, just just for your edification. I think 1995 wants to uh, comment back. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. sorry. I had to inject a little levity there. So uh, with that, call, colleagues, any other uh, thoughts on item C? We could certainly um, take action on this evening. Are you certainly could take action, Mr. Bertoni? Okay. In the... Uh, Point of order. Um, do we need to waive the three touch rule, or this is our okay. third touch? This is our third touch. Oh, our third touch. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then I would like to move resolution twenty four nineteen forty two amending the city of Lake Forest Park governance manual regarding public comment. Second. Second. 
it's moved, been moved and seconded and thirded. Do I hear any additional questions or comments from our friends here? Hearing none, all those in favor of uh, the amended re resolution 24, 1942, amending the City of Lake Forest Park Governance Manual regarding public comment, please say aye. Aye. Are there any nays? The ayes have it. Thank you, everybody. I know this has been a challenging situation and probably be revisiting it again, but I certainly appreciate, we all do, your efforts on this for the public. Um, is there any other business right now? Yes, Mr. Mayor, if I could yes, um, absolutely. raise a calendar issue for our March uh, meeting schedule. Uh, some of you may know that um, the mayor and I and our vice chair of the council will be going to Washington, D.C. for National League of Cities Lobbying Week for the first time since, uh, since before COVID uh, occurred. And uh, we'll be meeting with our delegation and talking about our city's priorities. Uh, we will be away on the March 14th uh, date for a regularly scheduled council meeting. So that meeting um, has already been canceled. However, when we look at the press of business, including the press of business to get ready for our strategic planning meeting, on March 23rd and also to prepare for a decision from the council around the end of March or the beginning of April on Lakefront Park preferred design concepts, uh, we still need another meeting. So I am proposing if it works for, other for, for the council members as a whole that we have a special council meeting on March 7th and that would effectively replace the one we've canceled for uh, for March 14th. So uh, just generally, um, if if uh, that's okay with everyone, uh, then we'll get that on the calendar. Thank thoughts? you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Bodhi. Uh, colleagues, uh, what are your thoughts? Conflicts on the 7th, Thursday the 7th? I don't have any conflicts. We have a thumbs up from anybody? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Lebo. Good. I think we're good. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Any other any other other business? Councilmember Riddle. Um, just an update that uh, yesterday at the Nusa uh, board meeting, I was provisionally um, voted in on the board, contingent upon approval by the council, as it is a city seat and not an individual seat. So. If I could, um, if council would entertain a, a vote uh, to appoint me to the new board, I would appreciate that so that we can button that issue up. Thank you for the reminder, uh, Councilman Riddle, and, and congratulations on the consideration there. Colleagues, what's your pleasure? This is not something that we need to uh, worry about the three-touch rule on because it's an assignment or appointment. I, I move that we um, approve Council Member Riddle's appointment um, representing our city at the NUSA board. Second. It's been moved and seconded to appoint Council Member Riddle to the NUSA board. Are there any comments? Mm -hmm. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any days? Abstain? Can I aye? I'll aye if I can. You're, you're, okay. you're, you're good. I would vote for you as well if I could. <laughs> Congratulations, Council Member Riddle. I know you do yeah. an outstanding job. Yeah, it's a great organization. Thank you for your service. Uh, council committee, Mr. Lee. Uh, you asked for additional uh, oh, yes. council discussion and action. And I, yeah. I would pose propose for consideration by the council members uh, that we change our three-touch rule with regard to administrative uh, actions to a one-touch. And that uh, council members are always free to request uh, that it be postponed for additional discussion. But where we have administrative functions, such as contracts or appointments, I don't know that we are better served by extending the conversation. Um, oftentimes our council meetings are full and being efficient about our time, uh, I think it has value to what we do as well as value to the public so that we're not having to justify every time why we decided not to do a three-touch rule for administrative functions. And that, I would say that to be non-ordinance, non-policy, non-resolution items. Thank you, Councilmember Lebo. Councilmember Fertani. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councilmember Liebel, for bringing this to our attention. I think there's a three-touch rule uh, portion in our governance manual. Mm -hmm. So, would an amendment to the governance manual be appropriate? Yes. Okay. Um, so, my question to the council is: as a proposal, is there any consideration for it? I um, don't want to propose something if the council says no. I have no interest in it. Councilmember Riddle. Um, I agree. I think that some of these are easy to know. It's free money. There's no match. We just move forward. I have seen, if I have, a, if I can off, ask a question of staff, I have seen sometimes we have ordinances or resol resolutions in the consent calendar. Mm -hmm. um, is this the kind of element that could go into the consent calendar? Um, and then if, if a council member wishes to speak on it or learn more about it, we can remove it from the consent calendar. Um, and what's your criteria for when you put a resolution in the consent calendar or not? In the past, we put those in the consent calendar when it is the third touch. There was no comment from council or the public at the second touch, so we just put it in the consent calendar. Um, we could, um, if you were to remove the three touch rule, you've seen it once, and we bring it back with no comment or comment addressed, we could put it there as well. So yeah. Might want a little direction though from council. Okay. Councilman Lee. So there are other bodies where they have subcommittees. And so it's not unusual to bring forward in a subcommittee a financial or contractual issue. And that the subcommittee uh, might do what's called a do pass recommend to the board. As a subcommittee, sure. uh, they make that recommendation and with the understanding that uh, when done so, it ends up on the consent agenda. So that's an example, but that works where you have a lot of material and you have boards uh, that have uh, subcommittees to do that. In our case, I think, for example, if you brought a contract or a grant uh, request to the council, it could be administratively um, passed by the full council at that one time. With always the opportunity for any council member to say, I have a question, would you please, please, please bring it back for, uh, for action based upon the response to the question. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bodhi. Yes, thank you very much. I was going to say something quite similar to Council Member Lebo. I, I don't support just putting things in the consent calendar, though I do support our current practice. If there are no comments and it's the third touch, I do think that uh, that it can go into the consent calendar. So I, I, I agree with that existing policy or practice that we've been using. I do think um, they should come. Some of these are significant and involved uh, money and or involve input from the council that's valuable for accountability of uh, both the, the contractor and the staff. So I support these coming to the council for one touch. And then any council member, as council member Lebo said, is uh, allowed to, as we did last time, to kind of call for a second touch or an update uh, coming back to the council. And, and in fact, it could get three touches if that was the, the, uh, the consensus of a council member to go forward and make sure we have the right document before we, we approve it. So. Uh, I think that that uh, sequence of uh, uh, escalating touches, if there are concerns, coupled with the fact that if our concerns are taken care of, um, it could go into, uh, it could be voted on on the first touch or go into the uh, consent calendar uh, for a third touch if there are no further issues. I think that procedure makes a lot of sense and we probably should update our manual. So I would like to call for volunteers to draft something up uh, and modify the three touch rule provision or clarify the three touch rule provision of our manual. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Bodie. Mr. Lebo. So I, I'd be happy to volunteer and I'm, I'm always uh, welcome other volunteers. The, the point I want to make, and the reason that if we decide to go with something that it, where it's administrative and it's a one-touch rule, to give council members the ability to say, I think I would like it to come back. And that's important back. because otherwise we could, as a council, simply vote to pass it. Whereas if council members feel as though they have the opportunity to say, I want to see it again, uh, it gives what would other by 
be a minority council member the opportunity and respect to be heard without having to push it through on the first try which could be done through a majority so I think that's an important thing that the council members feel like they have the power to say I'm not ready to vote on this thank you I think Mr Goldman was next um yeah I'm supportive of that approach also I would be willing to help on uh, wordsmithing the actual changes. And also, I do wonder, there is another thing in our governance manual kind of holding pen. Um, Council Member Riddle had put forward uh, some language about uh, committee liaisons. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, would this committee be willing to look at both of those and bring both of those to the council just so that way we, you know, we can amend the governance manual as few times as possible? Uh, wait, uh, excuse me for just a second. Is this on point or? I, I believe so. I, Please, I, then, I would say that okay? the the yeah. subcommittee for the liaison has not met yet. So we we haven't created that three person discussion. So if if council member Lebo wants to be part of a joint talking about both issues at the same time, I'm willing to do that. But I think we have to look at. I would suggest bifurcating, honestly. Which is but, fine with me. I just wanted to let you know that. That's where for time. Okay. You've been Thanks very patient. Me. Yeah. And, and th thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I think uh, since I'm currently on the committee that's looking at the liaison language, mm -hmm. um, I was going to offer one of two things, which is I could drop out, have C Council Member Lebo take my place, or as the mayor has suggested, we just simply bifurcate, keep the same committee, and then form a new committee to do the uh, language regarding the three touch rule so it seems like i'm getting nods on that second thing so i okay. think we'll keep them separate but we'll try to bring them at the same time mm -hmm. the deputy mayor Bodhi has a comment that was all i was going to say uh, i think we should keep them separate but bring them forward at the same time for efficiency great minds think alike thank you guys i appreciate that thank you uh council member Lebo. i think that's a very important okay any other other business while we're okay, we're moving on to council committee reports. Uh, we haven't had any council committees, council member reports. Colleagues, what is, what has been on your plate recently? Council member for time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, the one uh, meeting I was able to attend was the K4C outreach committee. And uh, uh, former council member Phillips reminded me that, uh, in fact, uh, House Bill 1433 on the home energy audit score is uh, um, one of our priorities in uh, pushing for or advocating with the legislature. Um, there is some concern about that language because the uh, actual audit is not mandatory. So uh, it bears uh, looking more carefully at as well, and we might be able to speak on that. The uh, one I really want to uh, mention is, I believe it's Senate Bill 6005, 6005, which is the uh, revert, revision of the RAP Act. So mm. you know that to be the uh, extended producer responsibility EPR uh, concept that uh, former council member uh, Casover was talking so much about. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, it's got a very good chance, I understand, of uh, passing this legislative session. So uh, that's one of the other priorities for our commission. Finally, something you may want to look at is uh, House Bill 2253 or uh, uh, Senate Bill 6113 on community solar. This is uh, addressing that issue with um, the meters running backwards. Uh, that provision has run out, so nobody's having their meters run backwards anymore, but this is basically an attempt to incentivize uh, installing not just for your own home, but of course for community-wide projects. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bodie, excuse me. Hello again, everyone. Hello. My giant face on the screen. Um, I wanted to uh, give you an update on the Parks and Recreation Board meeting, which was held on Tuesday night. Uh, our consultants uh, did an excellent job uh, presenting options for different components of the um, of the park concept or design concept uh, to the uh, to our uh, community team. Uh, it was based on the input from um, the survey and the and, and the workshop that was held. Uh, and uh, the the individual uh, board members have weighed in with their thoughts on the on the options. So there are options, for example, on the nature of the beach area or the dock configuration, um, the 
the configuration of the primary building and the decking around that building. Um, so those are examples of the kinds of, um, oh, there's one also for the, the building that people recommend to be a picnic shelter. There are different, you know, small, medium, large versions for that. So um, uh, I just wanted to say um, excellent work from our consultants, um, excellent work from our board. And the, the synthesis of that is going to eventually come to us. But in the meantime, the same exercise is going to occur where the, our, our community as a whole has an opportunity to look at those options or for that matter, propose other options for those different components at the workshop on February 21st. So it's very exciting. Um, it's a lot of progress. And uh, the outcome of that will be coming to us in, in March. And then we will have to make a decision by, um, by the end of March or the very beginning of April on what we as a council prefer go forward for grant funding. Uh, and recall that there is a two years, every two year cycle uh, for grant funding that we're trying to hit for the next stage here. But um, it's looking very good. Um, the input has been trending in a certain direction. Uh, and I, I think you'll be excited to see the materials when they come to us. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I think Councilmember Riddle, were you next? Or, no, I'm, I'm done. Councilmember Goldman. Um, yes, thanks. I attended RACER last night, the RACER Principals Assembly. Uh, we had uh, updates on how things are going. Overall, uh, things are going well. Uh, I think three core areas we talked about. The first was staffing. Uh, RACER is now fully staffed with 10 uh, workers, um, thanks to some grant funding by the uh, Washington Association of I think sheriffs and police chiefs, I think it's the acronym. Um, that's an additional three uh, temporary workers there, uh, uh, racer uh, workers there. And so that'll uh, be good. Um, we talked about some overall goals as to whether, you know, what sort of staffing levels we want to see for the cities, um, even though they might be staffed in, say, Bothell, they can go to any of the five cities. Um, there's especially strong between Bothell and Kirkland and Lake Forest Park because we're all on the same police band, which makes it much easier. Uh, we talked about how they're improving that, that right now the racer navigators are able to self-assign that uh, they see a 911 call they think would be a good fit for them that they would be able to support. They can essentially volunteer to attend that call alongside the police officer. So that's one of the core things we talked about. Um, we talked about ex possible expansion. Um, the earliest we could even consider that wouldn't be until this June, which is also when the uh, Rice's Care Center is going to be opening up in Kirkland. Um, so there's going to be very strong integration between RACER and the Crisis Center. Um, also, you should be aware the city of Redmond has officially uh, expressed interest in joining RACER. And so that led to a robust discussion Ooh. about what we want to see RACER become, whether we would want to expand and what that would mean in terms of service levels and access or if we would want to see more of an advisory role where RACER serves the North King cities, and then we could provide essentially consulting work for East King or South Snohomish. Um, but that'll be coming up. Um, it, it won't be for half a year, but that, that's something that will be coming up, what we want to see RACER become. Uh, Administrator Hill was also at that meeting. Uh, did you want to add anything? Thank you, Council Member. Colleagues, any other council member reports? Uh, okay, I will make, I guess that's me now. Wow. A um, couple of things. Uh, I'll, I'll start with some fun things. Uh, Mr. Adams and the chief and some of us were at the polar bear plunge at, uh, on a beautiful day. Sergeant Admin Adams went in. I did not. My health is not uh, amenable to that, but I understand it wasn't too horrible 34 degrees i think 35 okay well balmy right yeah. uh, there was a, a big there was an, a really nice picture in the shoreline area news of the team um there was the largest turnout yet for the rotary events uh to help um 
with some community partners and uh, it was a great event and the weather was absolutely perfect. It couldn't have been better. Last year it snowed literally 20 minutes before people jumped in the water. Really fun. Uh, Chief went in, uh, uh, Detective Teschloss went in, Mr. Adams went in, a bunch of other officers did as well. So um, some of them in full gear, which was impressive. Um, today we went up, we had a tour, uh, uh, Mark and uh, Jeff took us up on a tour of, or to look at the site of the 28th uh, Street culvert issue. That is a failing culvert up there. I'd invite you to take a look at it if you have a moment, because it's gonna be something that's gonna be probably coming back to council. Thank you very much, both of you, for your leadership on that. Um, very insightful. And it it is important because it's a an environmentally sensitive area, um, very near Grace Cole Park, as well as uh, property owned by the Stewardship Foundation, as well as the city. So uh, if you have a chance to go up to 28, take a look at that. Um, and uh, uh, I know that the team is working very hard uh, through Mark's guidance to get this resolved as quickly as possible as allowed by the regulations and state codes. Um, let's see. A uh, couple other things here. The Lion Creek Preserve staff has been working very hard to make sure that Lion Creek Preserve is secured and locked at night. Um, there was a, quest, a question from a member of the public about that. Thank you to staff, Jeff and your team and, and the PD as well as, and tag teaming on that. Um, uh, Administrator Hill and I had the pleasure of being guest of uh, um, Congresswoman Jayapal today. Uh, she very graciously invited us down to talk about our legislative priorities down at her office in Seattle. It was a really enjoyable meeting. Um, always a pleasure talking to her and her team. And uh, I will throw you a bone here, uh, Councilmember Fertani, that we're part of the conversation actually turned to the question of something you brought up before, uh, the ecosystem benefit monetization. You remember that conversation? Yep. Could you explain what that is? Because I will bludgeon it. it effectively, it's basically what is uh, uh, the nature doing for us? What are basically the economic benefits translated to dollar terms of our natural systems? Yeah, thank you for that. And it's uh, it's a really important topic because particularly in our community, we're doing so much for the environment. And this is a great way to kind of not only celebrate it, but also quantify it and show other communities the benefit of what we're doing here in the in the face of changes I'll, I'll leave it there but it was a great conversation a great follow-up from her team too as well talked about um their advocacy for us relative to sort of uh, smaller and middle-sized cities funding for cip our roundabout project our culverts pro culvert projects um as well as the one that we're doing in jo jointly with with Shoreline uh, up the way there. Um, and the last thing is I had a meeting with Dave up the Grove from the King County Council, also a member of the um, Sound Transit Board, a very positive meeting. Uh, I, I've invited him out to come and uh, do a tour of uh, our um, the proposed changes that are potentially coming down the pike to us so we can have a better understanding of what's going on. He's very gracious in his consideration of that. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, him joining us sometime in the very near future. I've also uh, reached out to um, Mayor Bernie's office to uh, try to get a, a meeting set up with her. She is now a member of the board of Sound Transit and a uh, great friend of this community. And I've uh, served with her on the Sound, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the Sound Cities Association pick. I think with that, yes, comes from a And on point, I just wanted to mention that uh, um, there was an open seat on the Sound Transit Board uh, as of December. We tried applying for it, but it turns out we're not East King County, which is what the uh, seat was reserved for. So as a result, we uh, did not get the seat on the board. However, as uh, Mayor French mentioned, uh, we do actually have other representation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Council Member. I, I do believe we're well represented by Council Member, uh, or Mayor Bernie, I should say. And um, and I know that we're all going to be working towards making sure that the, the relationship continues to grow with the Sound Transit Board. So I think that's all I had on my plate. Um, culverts, grant funding. Um, and again, as, as Deputy Mayor uh, Bodie mentioned, we're going to be in Washington, D.C., uh, Vice Chair 
Um, Fratani, Deputy Mayor uh, Bodie, and myself will be in D.C. with Jake Johnson, our, our federal uh, legislative um, lobbyist, and short short meeting, short series of meetings, but it'll give us a chance to kind of reset things since we haven't been back there for a period of time, as well as we have now joined the National League, rejoined the National League of Cities, which we have not been a membership uh, in had membership in, I believe, for, uh, I think it's, we have not been a member since I was a policymaker. So this is a priority because it is, all our surrounding communities are um, going to DC during uh, during the advocacy week. And it's something we need to ramp up our, our relationships with our, um, not only with our neighboring cities back there, but it, it there's definitely, uh, benefits and numbers in, in lobbying on the Hill together for common, the common good of, of the area. So, uh, with that, we have Mr. Hill. Just have a few additional items for you tonight. Um, so on the website, um, last year we had professional pictures taken. We have two new council members. And so we need to get those done. I, I have scheduled for February 22nd at around three o'clock if you're available. And then um, we would do the group photo as well after the two individual council members. And so um, for council member Bodie, I, I know you did this last year um, for the group photo, if you want to wear the same shirt so that matches your individual photo. That way we avoid taking individual photos of everybody because it's, it's it, we want to be cost effective. So um, luckily I have the same jacket, so great. no problem. <laughs> um, so if that works, um, for the group? I'm actually, uh, that's actually my birthday and I'll be out of town. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. I will push, I will get with her and push that um, to to March. I'm in Olympia that day until the council meeting okay. as well. Then we will move it. Um, I forwarded you an email tonight from um, Shelly Helder, our legislative lobbyist at the state level. Um, this is in, um, looking for support, sign on for Senate Bill 5770, raising the 1% to th possibly up to 3% property tax um, that could be done councilmanically. Um, there's a link in there to Candace Box um, email if you can sign on. She needs that no later than noon tomorrow. So please reach out well, to her. Okay. And then the last thing is, uh, to Council Member Bodie's point, the um, rapid fire rate at which the lakefront park is moving, Corey will be coming on February 8th to give the council an update of the process to this point in time, just ahead of the um, public meeting on the 21st. And that's all I've got. Thank you, Phil. Um, and with that, we're moving on to last but not least, but an important topic, executive session. Possible purchase of real property property pursuant to RCW 42.30.110 friends one friends B. We will not be taking action when we return. So um just to let the public know. Uh I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. How long are we thinking? No, 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 I don't think it's going to be that long. We'll, we'll say 20 minutes and we can extend it. So, um, all right, with that, we're uh, adjourned to an executive session. Uh, I guess.